What is it you most dislike? Stupidity, especially in its nastiest forms of racism and superstition. Christopher Hitchens, Hitch 22, a memoir. After making a particular video in which I compare both Linda Sarsour and Tariq Nasheed to peddlers of pseudo-religious truths, a position I still hold by the way, I received some constructive criticism from my comments. One comment, actually. The distilled version is that I didn't really address any of the arguments Tariq and his friends made in his documentary Hidden Colors 2. After some relatively unproductive back and forth with the poster of said comment, in which I felt we were mostly talking past each other, I decided that I would in fact address some of the assertions made in the original film. The reason? Because the commenter was right. I didn't do an effective job of arguing my position or listing any relevant citations or sources during the course of my video, which is another thing I'm trying to improve. Though I disagree with the commenter's opinions overall, I appreciate the fact that some of the feedback was useful in helping me to see my own shortcomings, and hopefully it will mean bigger and better things for my future videos. Or maybe not. But for now, let's take a look at some of the claims to truth from the wokest film this side of the third Matrix movie. The truth is rarely pure, and never simple. Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest. On Melanin. Melanin is a neurochemical that is produced in part through the pituitary and the pineal gland. They both play a central role in the production of melanin. The pineal gland, which produces melanin, it's shaped like a pine cone. And the origin of the word pineal literally means resembling a pine cone. Now, in ancient symbolisms, the pine cone has always been represented because people knew the importance of the pineal gland as it related to melanin and the universe. Claim. Melanin originates in the pineal gland in humans. The claim that melanogenesis, the synthesizing of melanin, has any part of its origins in the pineal gland is not accurate. Melanin specifically eumelanin and pheomelanin, the ones most often determining skin, hair, and eye color, are synthesized through a chemical pathway that starts most often with tyrosine, or in some cases with phenylalanine, and are catalyzed with the enzyme tyrosinase inside a cell known as a melanocyte. Melanocyte cells are found in the skin of all humans and in relatively the same abundance. Melanosomes, organelles within the melanocyte, are where the melanin polymers are created through branching chemical pathways. This process is somewhat affected by the melanocyte stimulating hormones, or MSH, produced in the pituitary gland, which was mentioned in the video as another point of origin for melanin, though not strictly true, as melanogenesis doesn't start with the pituitary gland or MSH in humans, nor does the introduction or absence of MSH have the dramatic effects observed in other mammalia. The pineal gland in humans, on the other hand, is mostly responsible for producing melatonin, which, along with serotonin, serves to potentially aid in establishing our day and night cycle. And despite a phonetic similarity with melanin, melatonin doesn't seem to play any discernible role in catalyzing melanin in humans. The overemphasis of the pineal gland's role in melanogenesis is, in my opinion, quite undeserved. I think it's an attempt to introduce pseudoscience and mysticism into the argument. Scholars and scientists have been having conferences about melanin uh, to my awareness, at least since the 1920s. The pineal glands of most of our white brothers and sisters are calcified, and so they make less melanin. And that comes from the historical relationship to what we call the Wormian Ice Age. Also, while on the topic of the pineal gland, the video suggests that the difference of pineal calcification in various racial groups is a causal factor in reduced amounts of eumelanin found in the skin of those peoples. While admittedly there are different calcification rates for this gland, it isn't confined to just the parameters of ethnic groupings. Age is another metric by which we see varying rates of calcification. This meaning that calcification is also a thing that occurs with age. The older you are, the more calcified your pineal gland most likely is, regardless of race or skin tone. There is also little to no evidence to support that the pineal gland is directly responsible for, or even related to, the amount of melanin found in a person. If this were the case, why would Japanese people be found to have very little eumelanin in their skin and still a mostly non-calcified pineal gland? Also of interest is the uncharacteristically calcified pineal gland found in some dark-skinned Ugandans. Melanin is an intelligence. 
It's an intelligence because it is the dynamic, the primary dynamic in every part of the cell. It's a primary dynamic in the core of the human being as well as to the surface of the human being. Not only is melanin a pigment, which is so obvious, but melanin as an intelligence is a communications module. Claim. Melanin is, in its own right, an intelligence as well as being a communication module. This sounds suspiciously close to nonsense. Describing melanin in this way is to regard melanin as having some kind of non-regulated independent awareness, which it doesn't have, or that it is some kind of neurotransmitter, which it is not. It could also be a reference to melanin's actual free radical scavenging abilities or its ability to act as a semiconductor, though without a clear outline of what is meant here, it is impossible to refute or verify. So, vague assertions without citations for the win, I guess. So melanin, from, um, from a uh, physical standpoint, is, is that substance that accounts for what black people refer to as soul. We move differently, we walk differently, we talk differently, because we have access to a different form of energy than other folk. Claim. Melanin has direct correlations with other physical characteristics or traits. Examples, locomotion, verbal communication, etc. The evidence to support this claim just isn't there. A group of people exhibiting such characteristics as particular tendencies of movement, speech patterns, and the like is much easier to explain by cultural factors rather than pseudoscientific ones. The so-called soulfulness of a person is a nebulous, non-quantifiable attribute. People's attitudes, thoughts, social interaction, and communication skills are probably somewhat impacted by genetic influence, which is much more likely than melanin playing a role, but even the effects of inheritable traits don't appear to impact human behavior the way that societal or cultural influences can. Is it surprising that many people share similarities to other peoples living in their communities? At any point, is the pigmentation molecule of melanin a better causal factor for these kinds of behavior? History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. Winston Churchill On Revising History In an attempt for Western powers and, and European historians to distance Africa from Egypt, because they, they, they try to pretend that Egypt and the rest of Africa is totally different. So what they did, they created something called the Sub-Saharan African meaning that the Africans below the Sahara Desert were somehow disconnected from the Africans in the north. Africans have always interacted with, the, with each other all over Africa. The more south you go, the more uh, African-centered you'll get. As, as you move more north, their, their attachment to those structures are, are just not there. There's a lot of reasons why that happens, just in terms of they know it's not them. They know it's not their mindset. They know that they want to exploit it but they do not know it. It is not part of them. They are an invading force. For them to be in Egypt today is equivalent to Europeans claiming America of 3,000 years ago. Claim Sub-Saharan African populations and North African and Egyptian populations were historically the same. Much controversy has arisen over the ethnicities and racial groups assigned to the present and historical peoples of Egypt, or the Kemet people, as they are referred to in the video. There has also been much debate over whether modern Egyptian peoples are representative of the Egyptians of the Pharaonic period. In short, this debate won't be settled here. That's well beyond the scope of this video. I will say, though, that according to research on craniofacial criteria, DNA comparison to modern Egyptians along with other racial groups, and cultural studies, there seems to be a significant admixture of various types of ancient peoples, from Saharan Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, the people of the Levant, and a myriad of others all found in ancient Egyptians, as well as strong connections to the modern Egyptian population. This is not very shocking as Egypt often served as a hub of cultural and economic exchange for disparate areas and peoples. So most likely not white, and probably not black either, but a spectrum. As a side note, I would like to add that I don't get the necessity of filing people into vaguely defined racial groups for political or ideological purposes, especially when those groups are so subjective. I don't believe that people can be considered white or black and determinations made about them simply by the superficial examination of the brown or black humelanin found in their skin. At what point is one black, or white, or Asian? What amount of melanin is required specifically? 
What phenotypic traits have to be observed before this determination can be made? What quality assessment can actually be determined? Are any of these assessments more informing than knowing a person's level of education, their age, aspirations, achievements, or voting habits? I don't deny that differences exist in people. Clearly, they do. But the variation within the group is often greater than that in between groups. The Dogon were a group of Africans from the West Coast who had, in fact, been able to achieve a degree of astrological superiority and dominance that we really don't see a contemporary for or precedent for other than what was achieved in Navali civilization. And people began to uh, chase the Dogon to examine them because you couldn't figure out how these so-called primitive Africans would have knowledge of, um, of astronomy, particularly the white dwarf star Sirius B, that Western astronomy itself is only coming to grips with. And so the Dogon have developed a kind of, um, um, I almost said infamy in, in, in the world. In fact, there's even a book called The Serious Mystery, and it's about how the Dogon, these primitive Africans, could have knowledge of a star system that's invisible to the naked eye. So the Dogon are black people in Mali with an astronomical lore. Claim. Dogon people had unparalleled astrological knowledge. The Dogon people of Mali are credited with much in the way of astronomical charting and observation. Most of this supposed stellar insight revolves around the Sirius star system. It is claimed that the Dogon predicted a second star in the Sirius star system and even a yet-identified third in some accounts. This is a surprising feat if true, as Sirius B, which does exist, would not have been visible to the naked eye of a Dogon observer and wasn't theorized to exist until the 1840s. Also amazing is that most of their knowledge and history was traditionally passed along orally. In fact, orally is how the knowledge of the Dogon was made known to the visiting French anthropologist Marcel Griol in and around the 1940s. Griol's work, consequently, is the source of much of what is known of the Dogon people. This is part of the problem, as the claim is hard to independently verify. All attempts to do so have been less than successful, with some critics saying that the Dogon had gathered knowledge either from earlier astronomers that had visited in the earlier part of the 19th century, or that Griol had himself fed them the information, or that the account of Griol is otherwise unverifiable amongst contemporary Dogon people. In any case, a third Sirius star was never confirmed, though at one time it had been suggested, also not clear is how the Dogon were supposed to have gained this so-called knowledge, unless you believe the account of the Sirius Mystery by Robert Temple, which suggests that the Dogon's knowledge is connected to extraterrestrial beings. In any case, this seems little evidence to support some kind of connection to magical energy or special information, as the earlier Egyptians and Greeks had made a habit of studying Sirius long before the Dogon were said to have esoteric knowledge of it. A potential misattribution of the nature of this supposed knowledge or the amount it actually correlates to reality, leaves a shaky foundation from which to extrapolate a worldview. The monument that we know is Stonehenge. A European writer by the name of Gerald Massey said in one of his books that Stonehenge was built by an African man named Morian. Now this is from a European writer, because a lot of times when, when black historians say something like this, it's, been, it's written off as being Afrocentric. But European writers and several other European writers say that African people built Stonehenge and other monuments up in Europe. Claim. African settlers built Stonehenge. This claim is one that is built on hearsay, misquotation, and observations drawn from folklore. The video references one Gerald Massey as claiming that the origins of Stonehenge lay with a black African builder by the name of Morian. Massey makes this assertion on page 218 of his 1881, A Book of Beginnings, based on two flimsy pieces of information. One is the phonetic similarity of the name Morian with the word Morian, used in later English to describe people of African descent. The other piece of information cited is a quote referencing the building of Stonehenge that comes from another book. It reads, Morian lifted the stones of the Katai. The quote is cited as coming from page 402 of an 1809 book titled Mythologies and Rites of the British Druids by Edward Davies. The problem with this is that the quote found on page 402 actually reads, We are told that the three mighty labors of the island of Britain were lifting the stones of the Ketty. No mention of mooring is made in this passage. Only on page 114 to 115 of this work does it make any mention of a Morian. In a tale related by way of a bard, 
and in that it equates Morian to a character by the name of Janus Marinus, which had some vague association with the founding of the supposed temple at the site of Stonehenge. Any search or attempt to find info on Morian or his role in the creation of Stonehenge inevitably seems to lead one back to Gerald Massey and his misquoting book written over 130 years ago. A book written by an author who has been previously criticized for his varied works on Egyptology due to his conclusions about history being largely inferred from his attempts at etymology. So, color me not impressed. I'd like to add that during my research for this, I did come across ample sources, including academic debunks of this revisionist and overtly racist pseudoscience propaganda, alternately referred to as melanin theory or Afrocentrism. Much of it seems to stem from the works of people like Francis Cress Welsing or Jawanza Kanjufu. This worldview has also been evidenced in a series of publications called the African American Baseline Essays. The science essay of that series, which contains many of the claims parroted in the Hidden Colors 2 documentary, was written by one Hunter Haviland Adams in the late 80s. An anthropologist by the name of Bernard Ortiz de Montiano published a paper debunking many of the claims as well as doing a lecture on the topic during the 90s. Coincidentally, some of his debunks mirror what I've stated, though it's not surprising considering that the talking points of the movie seem to be drawn from the same source that he was debunking all those years ago. I'll leave a link for anyone wanting to read this thorough and scientifically literate work. As for me, got more vids to research, more homework to do. If you like this video, or the changes I'm making to the format, let me know. Thanks for watching, you kooky kids. Stay scientific.